we're going to talk about rest, uh, all aspects of rest. There's, you know, it affects you in your secular world, spiritually, and it is something sacred. So we're going to start right out of the gate with a verse we hear a lot, which is uh, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, the where it ends, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Why, well, why do you think Jesus said he would give us rest? Because we don't get it in the world. <laughs> But it's not usually because we can't, it's usually because we choose not to, because we are restless. We are restless because we are troubled. We are wearied and, you know, burdened and bogged down with things. Jesus knows this about us. He recognizes this about us, the, what the world does to us and why we're so in love with it that we're afraid to leave the racetrack and get some rest because we might miss something. Now, most most often when we tell people um, we can't do something, if you ever notice we can't commit, I can't do that. The follow up statement is, well, I'm 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 busy. Uh, I can't do it because I'm I'm too busy and I've got this, that, and the other. But the truth is. Most of us allow other people to govern our schedules. We let other people run our schedules. They fill them up for us. Uh, We can get so busy and everything in there is because we couldn't say no to anyone. I mean, that's, and when I, by the way, when I talk about this kind of stuff, these sermons, they're for me too. When I research these topics, I think if I'm not getting anything out of this, nobody else is going to either. So this applies to me as well. And I've got something for myself in these sermons just as much as I do when I share them with you. Studies show that Americans get an average of two to three less hours of sleep per night than 40 years ago. Now, 40 years ago may seem like an eternity to some people, but it's not. And the interesting thing is the numbers of people losing sleep rose at the same time that smartphones came onto the scene, and insomnia increased when smartphones came on the scene, and divorce and infidelity. Now, now I'm not one of these people that's, that's anti-technology, okay, because there are several trends throughout the years that hit cultures, and they went together, and they affected the way we live, and it, whether you like it or not, it's true. I don't make up the numbers. I'm just reporting them. And have you ever noticed how we've also gone over the edge in life when it comes to avoiding rest with coffee? Coffee. It sounds like a silly thing, but people have memes about coffee. There are coffee lovers every day. They post things about coffee. I love coffee. And now we have coffee that is six bucks a cup. And it helps us get away from... uh, from resting, but it's not really coffee. It's a cup of coffee with a donut shop in it. That's what it is. That's why it's six bucks. And if you ask most people, including this guy, it's worth it. Um, and, and I'm a person who's cheap when it comes to that stuff. And I, I remember the very first time someone said, I would make fun of my friend. We worked at a construction company, and there was a Starbucks. And I said, why are you drinking that? You, you know, and I made all kinds of jokes. And he said, you should try one. So I did. And I said, totally worth it. And I got one every day after that. And I, uh, But it helped me avoid sleep. I wanted to stay awake. People don't just drink them at work in the morning. They stop and grab one on the way home and also with the emergence of the smartphones and coffee culture energy drinks exploded onto the scene it's like people hate sleep anymore i remember when my daughter once asked me when she was in school for art she was talking to me about careers because she went to the same college i went to and she she mentioned one time about uh hey what do you think about graphics in the video game industry and I laughed and said, no, they, they take your entire life from you. Every, every, almost every field that's tech will take everything from you. You will get no rest, and rest is sacred, and it's a commandment. And I told her, I said, if you don't believe me, um, look at the, the names of the two of the biggest video game developers. One's called Insomniac, and the other one's called Ready at Dawn. That's the name of their companies, and that's how they work. Insomniac and Ready at Dawn. That's your life. And when you read the thank yous at the end of their games and the credits, and you watch behind the scenes, they will milk you. 
The pressure to grasp for financial success and thrive in this world has become so fierce that companies no longer look at employees as a valued asset, but rather a temporary disposable necessity. You exhaust a resource until it collapses, and then you just replace it. And, and you just get a new one. Get out. I'll get a new one. And uh, like a gear and a machine. We got a whole box of them. Just let that one go and get a new one. And that's why people can't rest. They're constantly worried. They have to constantly be worried. And you know what else breeds workaholics? Good weather. Right? We, right now. Good weather. People want to get out and get stuff done. Summer's here. Yay. All right. There's signs to tell if you're a workaholic. And this, this comes around a lot in the summer. Are you, are you always in a hurry? Is your to-do list always unreasonably long? Do you use your day off to catch up on work or to get ahead in work? Do your friends ever tell you to slow down? When relaxing, does your mind wonder about what you could be getting done? Do you only take time off when you're sick? When relaxing in the company of your spouse or friends, do you keep one eye on your cell phone at all times? Do you sleep with your cell phone? When sometime, well, I'm sorry, when someone with you is to relax and they're constantly on their phone, I know it's a joke. It's a cultural joke. It's memes. We all talk about it. Hey, my kid did this or my wife does this with their phone. It, they are taking time away from a sharing experience with you. Even if you're doing nothing, you're just watching a movie, you're playing cards, you're cooking pizza in the kitchen together. Anytime that phone comes in, the sharing experience, which is part of relaxing, it is part of resting, is taken away. And the problem is, is that behavior and that thought pattern through the neurotransmitters in your brain becomes a pattern. It stays there beyond the realms of the cell phone, and it becomes easier and easier for that person to completely look at you as background noise in their actual life. And they treat you that way until something of higher importance comes along. Now, this is robbing you of rest because having good relations and good relationships are part of relaxing. They are part of rest. I'm not making this stuff up. It's verified in biblical philosophies and at the American Association of Psychology. The things that disrupt rest and relaxation aren't just used by the enemy to wear you out through fatigue. So, not in other words... <laughs> You know, when Satan mixes in our lives and robs us of rest, which is commanded by God, it's not just to make you tired, it's also to destroy relationships, to keep you from life's joy and personal relationships. And so there, there's a lot of things going on that we don't even think about when we don't rest or we don't relax with someone or we don't share ourselves with our spouse. We don't share ourselves with our friend. I don't, I turn my phone off. When I'm with my wife in the living room, my phone's face down. When I'm at my desk, my phone's face down. There's a certain ringtone that when she calls me that I know. When I go to bed, my phone stays downstairs. If we go out on the water, on the uh, river, my phone's in the house. We have phone protective cases. That way, if I ever want to go out by myself, I'll take it with me. But I'm telling you, these little things that I've done over the past year have, have helped me a lot. Just not be distracted with this burden box. And that's what it is, and it robs from you. Now, again, I'm not against technology. Man, I love these things. I use them. They save us a lot of time. But what good is saving time if the time you get is wasted? So it should be, it should be used in rest and relaxation and sharing and focus. Time, <laughs> people always say, time flies. It does. But remember, you know, you're the pilot. I mean, <laughs> you control where it goes. So... We can avoid rest so much that it prevents us from ever catching the things we were chasing. And a lot of times that's a good marriage or that's a good friendship or that's a good relationship or that's just plain old relaxation. Think about this verse in Job 20, 18. It says, what he toiled for, he must give back uneaten. He will not enjoy the profit from his trading. What that means is he's unable to relax, enjoy what he's worked for. He's unable to relax and enjoy what he's worked for. And there's always ways to combat that. People, well, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? I'm telling you, when I got, before I even had a job in ministry, I told anywhere that I worked, I said, I'm off Sunday, I go to church. If that's a problem, I can't do this job. Um, 
But I, I'm not coming in. And, and I was a high-ranking, I was a regional, over seven cities in one state. All the work that got done, I was in charge of it. And I said, I'm not coming in on Sunday unless there's an emergency, a life and death, flooding, uh, fire, something like that. Other than that, don't call me. I won't be here. I'll be at church. Is that a problem? They said, no. So they hired me. And, and I control that. We can control our schedules if, we, if we're upfront about it and we hold it as a priority. You need rest. There's always a way to combat this inability to rest. You can set your phone on idle. You can do some of that stuff. Um, the things I had mentioned. And I, I learned more and more that this applies to me as a pastor. I heard a, I heard a pastor say one time, talking about how, you know, to rest in Christ and rest in Jesus, and he was talking about the, a pastor's life, and he said, uh, it was actually, I remember it was Adrian Rogers who said this. He said, a pastor who is always available is worth very little when he is there, and that, at the time, I didn't understand that, and I thought, you're a pastor. All you do is preach on Sunday. Get over yourself. Then I became a pastor, and I'm like, oh, is that what everybody thinks about me now? <laughs> but, um, but he made a good point. It doesn't just apply to pastors. Uh, if you're always available all the time to everyone, anytime they call, then you're not going to be worth much when you are there. So I had, uh, I remember this joke. Um, it wasn't a joke. Uh, but, I mean, it, it was kind of handled that way. It's about three years ago. Somebody wanted to talk to me at church where I was, uh, I was an associate pastor. and said, I tried to call you on Monday. You didn't answer your phone. And I said, That's, Monday's my day off. And she said, the devil doesn't take a day off. And I said, and if I didn't, I'd be just like him. Is that what you want? <laughs> we had a little joke with it, but I admit I was a little frosted. And I thought, you know, come on. I, I have to rest too. I mean, I, I didn't... I. I it was a little giggle and a little laugh, but rest, look at it this way. If, for workaholics, if you think, if you meet the criteria for anything, any of the things I mentioned, God looks at rest as part of work. It is a part of work. He knows we must pace ourselves in order to grow. God wants you to develop in your relationship with him, with Christ, not to be overwhelmed to where you're worthless. Exodus 23, 29 through 30 says, I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I'll drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. What does that have to do with this? This is God talking to the Israelites about what he's going to do to move them into the promised land. The contemporary English translation, which I like because when someone doesn't understand the Bible and they go, what does that mean? This version prints it that way. This was the translation of that verse. I'm not going to give you everything I promised in a single year because you're not prepared to handle that much blessing. It would be too much for you to manage. Instead, you'll take possession of what I want to give you little by little so that you can grow. Then you will be strong enough to handle it all. So development happens at a pace that must allow for breathing and growth. This is a pattern throughout the whole Bible. Not just in Exodus, it's throughout the whole Bible. You have to have, you have, to have that as part of your equation. As God is growing um, you, your situation, it, I mean, as, as, as God is growing your situation, he's growing you with it. And you're not only your relationship with others, but your relationship with him. Uh, when, do, when does... I mean, when does your body grow? When it's sleeping. When you're, when you're asleep, that's when your body's going into action and growing. And it's, it's the same thing for why God mandates rest for us, spiritually speaking. Like I said, if it, if it makes you feel better, start looking at rest and relaxation as work. Because it is work. God modeled rest for us. That's why the Bible says he rested on the... God doesn't rest because he gets tired. God rests so he can model behaviors for us. To explain his reasoning is not something we can understand. We do it because he, he first modeled it for us. In Exodus 31, 7, 
It says, It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. God modeled rest not because he gets tired, but because he wants us to know the value of inactivity. Because for us, we need inactivity so we can be more productive in activity. And that's why it's there. A lot of people use that phrase, you know, recharge your batteries. When, yeah, I'm going to go on vacation, or I need a couple days off, or I just got to recharge my batteries. And that's true. And you, I mean, I know we know what it means, and we get the analogy, but your electricity, you can't see electricity. You can't see it. You can see the results of it. If somebody, get, if I get some dead batteries in this microphone pack, I can see the results. Light starts blinking. My voice isn't coming out anymore. There's problems. I can see the results of no power. There's no power there. There's no energy there. And then they're, when they're charged, the power's there. I can't see it. I can't touch it, but I can see the results of it. It's like the Christian, you know, your rest and your relaxation is in Christ, and it's evident to other people. When you don't have it, I can see the results of it. You can see the results of it. People around you can see the results of it. And when you do have it, you can feel the results of it, and you can see the results of it in your life. So that phrase, recharge your batteries, that's a pretty good phrase. It's pretty accurate. What's the source of our recharging power? It's God, because we're not just talking about the physical rest. When we, get, when we have the physical rest, the physical relaxation, we have the time with God. You have to recharge. You have to recharge your batteries. Rest is holy, and it's commanded. And if you choose not to observe it in that way, God will lay you down. He will lay you down. He's laid me down, and I'm sure there's people in here he's laid down. When you push and push and push, he will, Psalm 23. Psalm 23, the most quoted verse in the Bible. We skim over one tiny little detail in there. It models for us, you go through the whole psalm, and you know this is not a study on that passage. I think there's 10 different things. It talks about how a, a shepherd takes care of the sheep, but it's, it's, it's basically he feeds, leads, and meets their needs. But the, um, in 23, 1 through 2, right in the opening, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me, not, not, he allows me, he comforts me, he lets me, he helps me, he encourages me, he makes me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You ever had to see your kid? Calm down, calm down, come here. You just, here, you grab him the shoulders, you go sit down for a minute. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Has God ever had to make you lie down? He, a few years ago, he made me lie down. He blew out my knee. I was pushing myself in my own business. Very physical. My wife kept saying, you should hire someone to help you. And I said, I can do this by myself. God said, take a break for three months. Let me have that knee. And sure enough, there I was, horizontal. He made me lie down. It was because of that incident that I'm here now. Because I was already working in ministry and had, wasn't really convinced that I was going to go somewhere and move out of my wonderful comfort situation. I was serving two churches. And, but that's when God said, so you're going to do this for full time for me now. And he made me lie down. And thank, thank him, thank God he did. I bet he's done that to a lot of people in this room. Whether you, if you don't think, if you think hard, you can probably see it now in the rearview mirror. You can't, you can't serve God without rest. If you want to give God your best, you got to have rest. The different, the, and I sound like a, the cat in the hat. The difference between blessed and stressed is rest. <laughs> so, if you want to be able to do the most that you can, you have to be rejuvenated. You, I'm telling you, you need to think about this because I know people, even older folks that that are retired, they still they they do some of this stuff. They say, hey, what can I get done? It's Saturday. Some old folks push themselves harder than they should because they're like, I'm retired, and they want to be active. Because they're not old in their mind. They're not old at all. It's just we, the body betrays us. You know, we feel that way. If you've ever been close to anyone who's very old, 
They'll tell you that. They don't feel old in their brain. They just feel like their body's betraying them. So they want to push and push and push and push. God says there's a time to rest. You ever watch a little kid try to fight sleep? It is a sight to behold. They throw tantrums and they cry and there's nothing you can do to make them happy. They're immature. And eventually you're like, what is the matter with you? That, put that kid down for a nap. And God will do that to us if we don't follow the commandment. I remember when I was a kid, he said, go upstairs, take a nap. I said, I'm not tired. I'm not going to take a nap. You, you didn't talk like that to my grandma. She'd make me lie down. And she did. She would make me lie down. She had that board, that stupid board with the ball. She'd snatch that cord off of that thing, and that was kept in the drawer right next to the sink. Go lay down. Take your nap. I'm not taking a nap. Boom. Yeah, you are. I will make you lie down. Worked. She made me get that rest. You know why? This is going to sound weird. I'm going to take a hard left turn here. Um, you know why, according to the Bible, one reason people don't rest enough, they don't know who they are. People don't know who they are. They're in the middle of an identity crisis. They, they don't see themselves for what they are. They don't see themselves as child of God. Someone has to listen to this commandment of rest. I have to find rest in, in Jesus. I don't know who I am, so I'll identify myself by my works. My works define me. My net worth is my self-worth. My valuables are how valuable I am. I don't know who I am. That's who I am. That's why when you meet somebody, you go, how you doing? What's your name? My name's Bill. Oh, yeah? Where do you work? <laughs> why? <laughs> how valuable are you? Well, how much coin do you pull in? You want to date my daughter? She's expensive. What do you do in society? First thing people always ask you, where do you work? And I, and I know people don't have malicious intent. I'm just saying we're so used to defining ourselves that way by who, where we work and what we do because sometimes a lot of us don't know who we are. So we think, well, this is who I am, where I work, the company I started, how much coin I have. That's who I am. The more work I get done in the world, the more valuable I am. False. That is largely a Western construct, that view. That is not who you are. It's not who I am. You're a child of God. So am I. That's who we listen to the rules for. That's who's got the board in the drawer next to the sink. That's who makes you lie down. God. Ecclesiastes 10.15 says, The labor of fools wearies them. They do not even know how to go to the city. Okay, here's that today's English translation. Only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. That's the translation of that statement. We don't, when we don't know who we are, we try to establish our identity in our work. What I do for a living. How I contribute to society so I can be valuable to them instead of valuable in the audience of one, of God. That's where my identity is. I've heard my wife say to people a million times when they're in trouble, where's your identity? Trying to get them back on the road when they start steering off and hitting the rocks on the side. She, she uses that phrase. I know what she means. And that's an accurate assessment of that kind of an outlook. Materialism and envy also enslave people into working constantly. This robs people of rest too. This comes right, that's connected to the identity crisis because it's a byproduct of it. In Proverbs 23, four through five, it says, don't wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. When you gaze upon riches, they're gone. For they surely make wings for themselves and fly off into the sky like an eagle. I think it's interesting that our money has eagles all over it. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't not rest. Don't keep running. Don't work. Don't, don't constantly just do everything with your, because you don't know who you are. So you're chasing everything in the world to get some coin. All that stuff's going to fly away like an eagle. And it's not even in your grasp anymore. And you're standing there. You don't even know who you are. You're mine. You're my child. I created you. I want you to rest. Rest in me. Rest as I command so I can have you. I want your attention. I want you present. I want quality time with you. Works the same way as it does in our personal relationships. 
King Solomon observed, why rob yourself of God's gift and commandment of rest just to acquire things? That's what that whole verse is, is in support of. But King Solomon's, all of his writings were basically making that observation. Because money's not where your eternal security is. It's in Jesus Christ. Everything you're working for is going to go to someone else or the IRS. You're not, you know, that old saying, you never see a uh, U-Haul following a hearse. We're not going to take anything with us. I'm not saying you should be a bum and be lazy, but there, there needs to be quality rest, not the type that I talked about before. I feel, I, and I say this applies to me, I feel guilty when my wife and I have very different schedules. I will come into the church sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'll get home maybe at noon, and she's just getting ready to leave. And I come in, and I'm laying around, and I feel guilty. I'm like, is she looking at me thinking I'm not doing anything? I'm lazy, and I start thinking, I should do something. You, get, you feel guilt. You're like, man, I should do something. I should be getting something done. Wearing myself out, because that's who I am. That's my, that's my identity. When you define yourself by uh, your worth or your value, there's nothing wrong with having a good job. There's nothing wrong with making good money. But when you don't rest, you can't meditate on the Word. You can't read the Bible. You can't relax. You can't share yourself with a person. And if you can't do any of those things, you cannot and you are not sharing yourself with God. And people judge people like this all the time. Uh, you ever been to a funeral? And they go, oh, it was tragic. I mean, he was a nice guy, but he died penniless. People, people say that kind of stuff. He died, bro. He didn't. And I thought to myself, that's perfect. That's the best time to die. Right? I'm out of money. Check, please. I'm ready to go. I'm broke. Can I come home now? Perfect timing. He died penniless. That's how I want to die. <laughs> Everything's gone. I'm ready. Coming home. No, but they do. They attach that. that. That was their worth in life. No, it's not. Your child of God, your relationship with God is who you are. Exodus 28 through 10 says, and I'm going to get to a little touchy thing here. Uh, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. Lord your God, haunt it, don't do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, or your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor your, for, your foreign uh, resi- foreigners residing in your towns. So what's he saying? Everybody chill today. I don't want anything going on. I don't want to hear lawnmowers. I don't want to hear any work. Now, if you like to whittle and carve and that's your hobby, that's okay. That's relaxing. That's not work. You're not trying to make coins you're relaxing. That's okay. He's saying, I want the entire atmosphere to be calm. In Isaiah 58, 13, you must obey God's law about the Sabbath and do what please, and, I'm sorry, and do not do what pleases yourselves on that holy day. You should call the Sabbath a joyful day and honor it as the Lord's holy day. You should honor it by not doing whatever you please, nor saying whatever you please on that day. What's that saying? Saying the rest is a gift, okay? God wants you to rest. He wants you to enjoy that. It should be a joy. Don't when he says whatever you please, don't be worried about going out. Well, let me just I gotta go build a wall or install this AC real quick and make some money, because that's my identity. Don't do that stuff. If you want to do it, don't do it. Because relaxing is a joy. When people start getting too legalistic about the Sabbath and viewing it as a burden, and they did. Did you know old country Jews used to get so? <laughs> they, did, they did some outlandish stuff. Like they had a lot of rules in their legalistic system. You can't leave your yard. You got to stay home. So they would tie a string around their waist and tie it to one of their fence posts. And technically they were still touching their property. So they weren't leaving the yard. And they, they, yes, they, that really people did that kind of stuff. It, it's insane. And it shouldn't be looked at as some legalistic thing. Rest and the Sabbath is a gift from God. It's not a burden. People started to get too legalistic about it at a time, but Jesus cleared up all misconceptions, and he pointed out that it's a blessing. In Mark 2.27, it says, Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. There was a, we watched The Chosen. There was a scene like that. They were walking down the path, and Peter picked up some wheat. He was hungry, and they were all happy. They were having a wonderful time. And somebody said, ah, I can't eat Sabbath. You're doing work. He was pulling. He was like, oh. Jesus addressed it with the same same sensibilities. 
Sabbath was made for man, not the man for the Sabbath. Jesus is literally saying the Sabbath, rest, talking about rest, was made to meet the needs of the people and not people to meet requirements of the Sabbath. There was a time when you, you don't separate Sabbath from rest because they go hand in hand. The Sabbath is not so much a specific special day. Every pastor that I know, when, you know, when you talk with them, the, and, and me too, people come to me all the time and they still say, hey, is it supposed to be Saturday or is it supposed to be Sunday? And people fight over this. They fight a lot over it. And the answers are all through the Bible. It's so easy. I, I don't know why. It's not so much a specific day or a special day as people love to uh, argue about. It's a principle to seek a greater rest than Jesus dedicated to it. In Romans, listen to this. Romans 14, 5. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. This letter was sent to a church that was mixed with Jews and Gentiles because they did fight over this. They fought over which day was supposed to be the Sabbath. Paul said, just I, listen. Don't argue. Pick your day, and it's that day. The two parties tried to reinforce their views on the Sabbath, on to eat, force them onto each other all the time. And Paul made the point to them, whatever your conviction is, just honor it. If you're going to make this day, it's your Sabbath, to be sacred to God, that's your Sabbath, then you do that day. It's like when God wrote, and I'm, I won't argue with people about this. It's like the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus wrote. He criticized every church for something, didn't he? But the one thing he never said was, you need to be like the church over here. They, I want all of you doing that thing they do. Or I want the church in Thyatira to be like the church in Laodicea. Do this. All of you do this exact same thing. No. The point of the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus repeatedly made is when you say you're going to do something sacred and holy to uh, in your congregation for me, then you do that. Then you do that and you stick to that. You honor me, then honor me. And that's the point that Paul is reinforcing about rest and the Sabbath. Whichever conviction is, you honor God, you stick to it. Select a day and accept it. And enter into the rest provided by Christ. Paul also talks about accepting rest in Jesus by telling them that being legalistic on the matter and quarreling about it is a bunch of nonsense. The point is, again, stick to your convictions for how you serve the Lord on which day is the Sabbath. In Colossians 2, 16 through 17, he says... Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or what you drink or not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. These rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and that reality is Christ himself. We know how important the issue of the Sabbath is. And if it helps you think about it any deeper, quit calling it your day off. Start calling it your Sabbath. This is my Sabbath. When people ask me to do stuff on Sunday, I don't do anything that's not associated with resting or relaxing. I come here after this, I, I worship, rest, and decompress. I don't go to Bible studies, I don't do any of that stuff. I might go out to eat with somebody, that's resting, that's relaxing. I spend time with my wife, that's resting, that's relaxing. I don't do, I don't stand up and talk and point and sit in a circle of people, talk about scripture interpretations, that's, that's, I do that all week long. Monday's supposed to be my day off, but it never is because I choose to come in and, and edit the videos and stuff until, until I get tired. Then I go home. Sunday, I don't do that stuff. After church, everything I do is joyful. Like if we do baptisms, that's relaxing for me. That's a joy for me. That's, that's rest for me. This message applies to me. I needed to hear it, and I needed to say it. It's like confession. When you confess things, that means you're agreeing with God. And I can't preach any sermon, like I said, if I, if I don't need it too. This applies to all of us. We're in the same boat. Learn how to rest. Learn how to rest. And you know, this picture illustrates a lot. Because if you want to give God your best, you have to have rest. He tells you that. And get into your Bible. Get into your Bible. You know, take the entire Sabbath and day off concept together. Stop and smell the roses and stop and read the Moses and, 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 and get it together. And you are going to be recharged and you're going to be better for your family. 
but most importantly, you're going to be better for who you are and your true identity, a child of God and your relationship with Christ. So don't feel guilty. Don't be afraid to say no uh, without giving an excuse. You know, we all do that. Stop doing that. Don't give a reason. Just say no. I do it all the time. I, we all do. Hey, can you help me do this? I can't because I got a blah, blah, blah. I can't because even when people say, can, I need volunteers. People are like, oh, no, I got two extra, day, two extra hours tomorrow. I should volunteer. No. No, you don't have to do that. And I'm the pastor of the church. We need volunteers for all kinds of stuff. But it's not more important than you following the mandate of God to relax and to rest because he needs you to be refreshed for him. Do that first. Don't give a reason. Just say, no, I can't do it. If that means you're going to go home and eat and take a nap and you're going to go outside and play with your dog for the rest of the evening and fall asleep on your swing, then that's fine. Don't have to give a reason. Just say, hey, you know what? I can't do it on Saturday. And leave it at that. Learn how to say no without giving an explanation. Except that don't fly with your spouse, I learned. They usually want an explanation, so you can give them one, but nobody else. All right.